to get started. Um, we have a lot of content to share this evening. And so I just wanted to first just welcome everyone. I'm just really, uh, really glad that you're able to be here today. This is such an important topic for the type one community. And I'm really grateful to our speakers this evening who have taken time out of their busy schedule to speak to us. Um, I wanted to start by introducing myself. My name is Katie Hawk, and I'm the Assistant Director of Marketing and Communications here at Sansom Diabetes Research Institute. Um, I've lived with diabetes for type one diabetes for over 35 years, and so I'm definitely in this with you all. Uh, we have a lot of new people on the call, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Sansom Diabetes Research Institute, if you're not already familiar. Um, SDRI is located in Santa Barbara, California. We do have a lot of people on the call out of state. Um, and it was founded by Dr. William Sansom, who was the first physician to manufacture and administer insulin in the US. Uh, since our founding in 1944, SDRI has been focused on improving the lives of people impacted by diabetes through research, education, and care. And I'm just really incredibly proud of our medical team and their leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we've been able to move forward with clinical research trials in a safe and distance way since the pandemic started. And it's no easy feat to completely change how we operate in our research, but they've been able to uh, pivot and do so just to move diabetes research, uh, the needle forward. And so I'm just, I'm really proud of that. If you are um, at all interested in getting involved with clinical research, you all have my email, you can drop me a line. The only requirement is that you are able to travel to Santa Barbara um, on site for the, the trials. Um, later, Dr. Castorino is gonna be talking a little bit more about, about the trials, but uh, we would love to, to get you involved if you would like to. Um, and before we get started, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping items. We have a lot of people on the call, about 100 people. So if everyone could keep them, their selves muted, it just uh, ensures that we can hear our speakers. And also with the number of the people on the call, I recommend using speaker view so you can see our speakers. Lastly, I'm gonna be recording this meeting so it can be viewed at a later date. I'll post it on our YouTube channel and um, um, so you can send out the link to friends and things like that. Um, and I just wanted to move forward and introduce our incredible speakers this, uh, this evening. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Kristen Castorino is a senior research physician at Sansom Diabetes Research Institute. Kristen, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so um, my name is, is Kristen Castorino. I've been at SDRI for 12 years um, and and I specialize in diabetes and diabetes in pregnancy. Um, so I generally, with in terms of patients, see pregnant women with gestational diabetes or type one diabetes in pregnancy. And then I also, from the research bit, I have worked with all sorts of different types of research studies, um, including artificial pancreas, diabetes in pregnancy studies. And most exciting is we have some new uh, sensor studies um, coming up right now, uh, including the G7, uh, Dexcom's next iteration of their sensor, as well as Libre3, um, their next generation of their sensor. And it's so wonderful to see technology moving forward, even amidst the, the, the pandemic and these, these crazy times. Thank you so much, Kristen. It's exciting to hear about what's coming down the pipeline. Yeah. Um, Kristen Nelson is our next speaker and she has a master's of science in nursing. She is a nurse practitioner and a clinical nurse practitioner here at SDRI. Um, Kristen, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, everybody. A um, couple of familiar faces, a couple of parents that I know. Um, I um, My background is in family practice. I'm a family nurse practitioner, which means um, I, um, in uh, clinical care, took care of anywhere from newborns to any age that wanted to walk in the door. Um, the great thing about being a nurse is you can um, jump into different roles. I have been a um, credentialed school nurse in the past, uh, urgent care. Um, I have a lot of um, in information and experience in um, pregnancy and um, 
primarily my role at SDRI is as a sub investigator for the innovation team um, where we do uh, see um, pediatrics um, according to the protocols, young as, you know, toddler age, all the way up to any age again that uh, wants to walk in the door. And um, I, I am um, really, really happy about how our studies have been able to continue um, our innovation team, as well as the majority of SDR staff uh, was able to qualify as um, uh, early early uh, vaccinated staff due to the fact that we have such a, uh, extremely close con contact with not only our patients, but our subjects, um, helping them put sensors on and things like that. So uh, subjects that are in our clinical trials at this time have um, uh, fully vaccinated staff uh, helping them. We also have changed how we do our studies so that each subject are in individual rooms um, and literally have um, a dedicated staff that do nothing but um, clean and sanitize uh, doorknobs, kitchens, everything in our area. So um, it's really made our research uh, subjects feel very comfortable about continuing on and being part of our research. And I can't wait to help answer uh, questions tonight and, and um, uh, provide you some resources of where to get some more information if we weren't able to answer your questions tonight. So hi, everybody. Thank you to both Kristen and Kristen. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank you all for submitting questions. I've passed them on to, to um, Dr. Castorino and Kristen Nelson. And so we're going to get started with answering the, the most common questions that we got. If by chance we don't answer some of your questions this evening, feel free to shoot me an email and we'll get you those, those answers from our medical team. Um, but before we get started, I wanted Kristen just to, to give a little bit of background information. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first off, I um, wanted to say that what we're talking about tonight is, is designed to be informational and educational and is not medical advice. Um, just as we talk about for all of our other one talks, um, Really, what's right for you is something you need to talk with your healthcare provider and your your diabetes specialist because they know you. They know your exact individual scenario, and so they can help you decide what's the right next thing. Um, and so that's the gist of it. This is just educational information for tonight. Great, thanks, Kristen. Um, so the first question is, uh, Dr. Castorino, how does the COVID nineteen vaccine work? All right, and I, you know, jumping into this question, we have a variety of people here from all sorts of backgrounds. I imagine some of you have spent hours reading, researching, and you may not, you may not already know most of this information and others are, you know, there, there's all sorts of uh, backgrounds. So we really wanted to just kind of stick with a straightforward kind of question and answer. Um, we by no means are COVID experts, we're diabetes experts and um, are applying our expertise in diabetes as we navigate the world of COVID. Um, so I wanted to plug that as well. Um, Kristen Nelson mentioned that we are all vaccinated um, here at SDRI, all of our staff who are currently in the building. And one of the things I wanted to mention is even though I'm I am fully vaccinated, I still wear a mask. Um, and so I have my mask here, I still am wearing it at work. Um, and you know, even the medical mask underneath and still wearing it everywhere I go. And that's an important thing that, that the vaccine will help us, but, is, but there's still more to navigate. So jumping into how uh, this vaccine works, I, rather than, I'm gonna try and explain it, but I thought a video would also be helpful. Um, the bottom line is the current uh, COVID vaccines are mRNA vaccines and the way that they're, they work, uh, the best analogy I can think of is it's kind of like getting cliff notes or blueprints of, of what the, the bad guy or what the bad virus is, what it looks like. 
so that your immune system has the answers already and can already mount to its response a little bit and be prepared. And so that's why when you hear about people having right reactions to the, the vaccine, that's because they're, it's their immune system working and ramping up and being ready to go. So that's our little primer. And then we're gonna switch to this video. Um, Katie, you guys can see it? Yes. Okay. Taking on average, uh, it's usually a very lengthy process, taking on average eight years to get approved. Since a few years, we have the ability to create mRNA vaccines, which can be developed much faster. So how do these vaccines work? Are they safe? And how do they compare to traditional ones? But first, you must understand how the immune system works. When a virus enters your body, it will attach itself to one of your cells and inject its DNA or RNA into it. This is like a blueprint for your cells, containing instructions on what the cell has to make. So in this case, the virus's RNA will tell your cell to make more copies of the same virus. They become factories assembling a virus that can infect even more cells. But don't worry, our bodies have a defense system for foreign intruders. The immune system attacks any protein, virus, or bacteria that does not belong in our bodies. But it takes a few days for it to learn how to attack the intruder. Meanwhile, the virus factories are running nonstop, quickly replicating the virus and spreading it in your body. In other words, you start experiencing symptoms of whatever has infected you. After a few days, however, your immune system will have figured out how to attack the virus and will start producing antibodies. These attach themselves to the virus, preventing them from infecting more cells and marking them for destruction. As you can see, the immune system is remarkable, but it's slow to mount an attack. That is the reason why we can get sick in the first place. So to give it a helping hand, we developed vaccines. The main idea is to train your immune system to recognize and fight off an infection before it has occurred. Almost like showing your immune system a mugshot of the virus and saying, if you see this, kill it. There are various types of vaccines, but let's take a look at the new kit on the block mRNA vaccines. To understand how they work, let's take the COVID-19 pandemic as an example. You might have seen pictures of the virus with its distinctive spikes. These spikes allow the virus to attach to specific cells in your body and infect them. Now, here's the key idea for the COVID-19 vaccine. What if we could train our immune system to recognize these spikes by having our own bodies produce them? To do that, researchers took the virus's blueprint, its RNA, and isolated the part responsible for producing the spikes. Armed with this blueprint, they created mRNA, or messenger RNA. This is a special form of RNA that can enter your cells and give them instructions. In this case, the RNA contains instructions to build the spikes of the coronavirus. Not the virus itself, just the spikes. So mRNA vaccines contain instructions for your cells that tell them to build a part of a virus in large volumes, almost like giving them a recipe to follow. Once this is happening, your immune system kicks into action and starts learning how to attack these intruders. Again, it takes some time for the immune system to fight off these spikes, but you won't get sick because it's only the spikes, not the virus itself. And that's it. Your immune system has learned how to attack the spikes of the coronavirus. It destroys all the spikes and even breaks down the mRNA vaccine itself. The only thing left in your body are special B cells or memory cells. These can linger around for months or years until the same virus affects you again. When that happens, the B cells can produce the correct antibodies right away, preventing the virus from spreading and making you sick. What's interesting about this mRNA technique is that it's relatively quick to develop a vaccine as soon as we know the DNA or RNA sequence of a virus. And secondly, because the vaccine only makes our bodies produce a tiny part of a virus, we cannot get sick from it. More traditional vaccines use weakened versions of the actual virus. This also triggers an immune response, but could also give you mild symptoms. Now you know how mRNA vaccines work. But don't take my word for it. All sources used to make this video are listed in the description below. Check it out if you want a more in-depth explanation. Give this video a thumbs up if you found it. All right. So 
So in summary, um, it, it's, it is a new type of virus, but it's a technology that we've been wanting to apply to, to making vaccines for a long time. And one of the wonderful parts of it being a blueprint type vaccine is that as we're having to deal with the various COVID variants, we can then, as we're making the vaccine, say, okay, now we're gonna apply this slightly different blueprint for this variant so that we have immunity to that if we need it. So far, it looks like it's covering um, the current vaccines um, do provide protection for the variants, but, but it is a wait and see game. I think also that the fact that this, uh, this, this technology has not just been used for a COVID-19 vaccination, it also has been used for uh, the Ebola virus. There is an Ebola vaccine now that used this technology. And so uh, if you recall several years ago when um, I believe in Texas and a few other states, there were um, just, a, just a handful of cases of, of Ebola virus um, that they took this technology and created a vaccine at that time. So this is not the first time they have used this, but also this is not going to be the first, you know, the, the, the first and last time that we're going to hear about this technology. Uh, more than likely any other new viruses that come into our future or um, new epidemics, things like that. This is where, you know, this is where it's going. Um, just like we've gone from finger sticks to CDM, you know, we, we you know, we carry on that that technology that we learn uh, learn about. So um, this is not the first rodeo for um, epidemiologists to to learn how to, to how to use this. Uh, another uh, question about the vaccine and uh, the fact that it it is um, affecting our uh, training our immune system is if you notice in that video, um, this vaccine is not entering into our cells and altering um, the nucleus or our DNA in any way. It's, it's working on the surface of these cells. So um, that's something also um, to be aware of when, when uh, uh, someone is asking about, is it, is it altering my DNA in any way? So um, very new technology, but not untested technology and part of our part of our future to keep us safer quicker next time around I hope yeah and one of the things to mention about the approval process and this is actually true for all things that go through the FDA evaluation and approval process is there's before the thing is the medication or the device is authorized the FDA has to there has to be uh, receive all the safety data from the studies. Um, so, you know, for example, for the um, Dexcom G7, that's what we're doing. The study is we do the study, then we review the data, and then some, it gets submitted to FDA. Well, same thing with the, these vaccines. But the other thing you may not know is there, there is also a whole evaluation for safety after something is approved. Um, and, and so, for the COVID vaccine, this V-SAFE is the CDC's uh, surveillance uh, system, which is um, actually really easy to use. Um, and I encourage everyone when they do receive the vaccine or if they have already to use, to sign up and do, participate in this V-SAFE because what it does is it collects all everybody's reactions. And so if there are any atypical reactions that this is the easiest, most, um, um, most accurate way to, to begin to collect that data. Um, and so that's why we, how we can all do our part to learn more about, about our, our rapidly changing world. And I think that's enough for this. We're, we want to keep on track. So I, time for the next question. Okay. Thank you so much to Kristen. Uh, Kristen, do you want to stop sharing your screen as we move on yep. to the next question? Thanks. Thank you. Great. Um, so this next question is for Kristen Nelson. Is the vaccine safe for people with diabetes? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, and that goes for everything that's currently uh, being used, Moderna and Pfizer, 
um, potentially uh, the Johnson and Johnson vac uh, vaccine will be coming out um, in the future. Um, just like in our in our clinical trials, when when we receive protocols, they they request a, a certain number of subjects in certain subgroups because they want to make sure when they um, submit that information to the FDA, they want so many. Um, uh, kids in a certain category and so many adults in certain age groups and um, specifically what, uh, you know, what their A1C is at the time or, you know, do we have people that are in, in more uh, tighter management versus uh, someone who doesn't have as well of management. And so they, they also, um, uh, you know, included in, and this information is, is available on lots of websites, uh, Pfizer and Moderna both took um, specifically uh, subjects that had type one, type two, uh, gestational women that were pregnant and had gestational diabetes, and um, they were they were part of that cohort cohort of um, you, you know assessing this vaccine. How was it effective? Uh, did certain subgroups? or sub, uh, subgroups that had certain races or certain age groups, did they seem to have more side effects or adverse events? Um, so all of those things you know, in, were included to be sure that before it was available uh, to the general public that they had that information. Um, and so whether, you know, when, when, you're, um, when this vaccine is available, whether um, they let you know only the Moderna is available or only the Pfizer. Um, being somebody over 50, um, I absolutely um, was not concerned in any way uh, after, you know, watching all of this data. Do I get the Pfizer? Do I get the Moderna? I was just pleased that I, I had access to it. My uh, I have a younger daughter who's an RN in San Diego and and we teased each other back and forth that um, you know she got the Pfizer and I got the Moderna and and uh, you know neither of them uh, you know was I concerned about my my own child who is an, an a registered nurse in San Diego. I absolutely had had no concern other than the fact that um, I slept a little better that, that first night knowing that, that she was, you know, she was in line and, and things were moving forward. So um, these, these vaccines at this point, um, and, and now that we have more and more uh, data that they're collecting um, are finding that um, any potential risk um, versus having a COVID infection, um, that there's just no question about that. Um, the information about people that are having anaphylaxis, there's a very specific ingredient in both, both the Pfizer and Moderna um, called uh, polysorbate, which is, is where we're getting tripped up with people having anaphylaxis. Polysorbate is, is actually the same. It, what that is, is it, it's carrying this vaccine into our system. That is the same um, ingredient that is found in um, a lot of preparations for colonoscopies. Uh, it's over the counter under the name of Miralax that you know some people have taken for constipation or irritable bowel syndrome. So if you know that you've had a sensitivity or had um, a, an allergic reaction to some unknown ingredient when you were um, having your preparation for colonoscopy, that, that particular ingredient could be what had caused um, your allergic reaction. And, and so, you know, the, again, this is something that's available right over the counter and, and it's just um, what helps transport this vaccine into our system. Um, so um, those, those subjects that have had sensitivities, uh, when you're in line getting this, um, this vaccine, there are physicians from the county health department that are literally in line um, re-asking and re-screening you step by step to be absolutely sure that um, you're not uh, someone that has a history of uh, anaphylaxis or an allergic reaction to those ingredients. Um, and so I, I think they've done a really great job of, of screening um, through that process to be sure. And what happens if you had 
a, a severe uh, reaction to an immunization or a potential ingredient of this vaccine, what that may mean is they may pull you out of this, this line of these mass vaccinations that are occurring and recommend that you get your vaccine in uh, your primary care doctor's office where they can really watch you one-to-one. -one. Um, however, even in these mass vaccination programs, they do make you wait and um, at least 20 minutes to be sure that you're not having any sensitivities. And while you're sitting there, there's, there's literally paramedics and physicians in that waiting area um, keeping an eye on you. So um, it's very reassuring if, if you do have any um, misgivings about getting in line for that vaccine, you're well taken care of. Great, thank you so much, Kristen. Um, the next question we had is for Dr. Castorino. And the question is, how will the vaccine affect my blood sugar levels? All right, uh, so the vaccine, as we saw in the video, the, the way the vaccine works is it's giving your immune system the answers to the test, but then, then your, your immune system's job is to actually mount an immune reaction. And so those systemic feeling symptoms that you feel when you're starting to get sick, chills, um, achiness, just kind of that all over, maybe you, you know, and different people have slightly different feelings of it or, or degrees of it, of severity. Um, that's what's happening when you receive the vaccine. And so when you have those, those symptoms, yay, the immune system is working. But what affects blood sugar? Everything, absolutely everything. So is this gonna affect your blood sugar? Heck yes, um, definitely. And you know, and, and everyone's different. Um, and just like every, every day with diabetes is different. And you can have one meal and your blood sugar does whatever. And then the next day you have the exact same meal, do all the exact same things and your blood sugar is slightly, slightly different. And you're like, what the heck, what's going on? That is unfortunately seems to be part of type one diabetes. Um, so what in general we have seen for people with, um, <laughs> with, with diabetes is, is that, and without diabetes is the first vaccine that they receive their immune system seems to mount a little bit smaller reaction. And so it doesn't affect blood sugars quite as much, but then when you get the second, the second dose, because your immune system already has some of the answers, it's like, it, it just like kind of really, really goes. And so you have a bigger sy systemic reaction. So more fever, more chills, more achiness, um, and what I have heard anecdotally is that people can have wacky high blood sugars for up to a week after the vaccines, particularly the second dose. Of course, everyone's different, you don't know. And so what I'm recommending to my patients is having a sick, just have your sick day plan ready. Plan to feel yucky, um, probably, I mean, just plan for, for both doses. Um, plan to feel yucky, have, your favorite hydration things have your, you know, all of your emergency supplies for going high or low. Um, talk to your diabetes care provider if you don't have something. Um, or, you know, even if you're like, you know, I had, you know, I feel like I developed ketones or I had a weird DKA thing recently, just go reach out and say, hey, I just want to be really prepared and I want to review my sick day plan. Um, and, that being said, people with diabetes, as more and more information is coming in, we see absolutely no reason to, no contraindications, get the vaccine overall, overwhelmingly beneficial um, in terms of the risk benefit uh, ratio. And, and yeah, you might feel yucky and that's okay. I mean, it's doing its job. And this isn't going to be the first time you've ever had a low grade fever. This isn't the first time you've come down with, you know, a, a cold or, um, you know, low grade fever, chills, achy feeling. How does that usually, how does your body usually respond to that? You know, if, if when you're coming down with, with a, a viral illness, if, if you know that you usually kind of spike a little bit, 
um, or you know that you know you're just somebody with a much more sensitive stomach and you just absolutely don't feel like eating when um, you're feeling that achy kind of feeling, you know, kind of prepare for what, you know, what, what happens with my body when I go through this before, because again, these, these symptoms won't be anything, anything new that you ha haven't felt before. So um, just kind of preparing for, for that kind of scenario, um, you know, I, I think would be, would be really helpful. Perfect day to take a mental health day the day after the vaccine. Yeah. perfectly great excuse yeah and and actually the the cdc had put some information out for healthcare providers because you know we want everybody to we don't want people to a bunch of healthcare providers to get the vaccine and call in sick and so you know one of the things is staggering the vaccine as a strategy another one is you know doing it before a weekend if possible um with the way vaccines are being rolled out in general, we don't have a lot of control on a lot on the timing of when you get the vaccine. And so, so maybe you just kind of plan to have a light day um, the day after the vaccine so that you can, you know, or, you know, if you can just re plan to have a sick day, that, that, that's what I asked for my team and it, it just makes things a little bit more manageable. Um, so you're not trying to, I had, I had one team member who had a, um, I think a midterm the day after the vaccine. I'm like, hmm, let's see if we can shift some things around because it's hard, you know? Yeah. Well, that, that's really helpful information from you both. Thank you just for the different perspectives. And again, the, um, <clears throat> importance of having that sick day management plan as a type one is just important across the board vaccine or not so that's just a, a nice good reminder as well uh, the next question is kristen nelson you already kind of answered this but i just wanted to give you the opportunity if there's anything else um the question was does it matter what vaccine you get and you already kind of touched on this but i just wanted to give you the opportunity to if there's anything else you'd like to add to that yeah just um you know um the other vaccines have not uh, gone through the process of FDA, um, you know, really going through it with a fine tooth comb other than the Moderna and the Pfizer. And um, over and over and over um, all, all of the reports, you know, again, as even as we really expand how many people are being vaccinated, um, uh, those both seem to be equally effective and safe and uh you know there's you know a little bit of update on cdc of moderna seems to be still covering all the variants and then the next day pfizer is absolutely still covering all these variants and they're both back at the drawing board to make sure they're ready if they need to add or be ready for a booster of any kind so um uh majority of the time when uh, it rolls out to the next phase and the next group um, that is available, um, it's likely that there won't be a lot of choice um, available that, you know, they'll, they'll let you know, you know, look, we've got a big supply of Pfizer. Uh, we've got a big uh, a group of Moderna and you're it, it's your turn, absolutely. Um, Again, my own children, I would have not made any, any, dis, any distinguished, you know, uh, plan on uh, holding back when it was their turn or my turn in, in any way. Um, and um, at this point in time on February 17, 2021, there has not been uh, any, any uh, between the two as far as being uh, superior to the other at this time. Kristen, can you remind us to the age ranges for the Pfizer versus Moderna? As far as how uh, how far they're going to approve those? Yeah, it was, is the Pfizer uh, 16 and up, is that correct? And Moderna is 18? You know, I think by the time we actually get to those age groups, um, I, I, I really feel like um, they're there isn't going to be a, a distinct that that distinguished um, issue, you know, when when we're able to actually pop, you know, immunize the general population. Because even though 
both of them are out, you know, with FDA emergency approval. They are continuing their studies. They are continuing to enroll younger and younger age groups, more, uh, more pregnant women, more, you know, all, all of the, the, the smaller populations that they didn't necessarily get a larger a swatch of to get the emergency approval. We're, we're still getting information uh, day by day with, with those. So I think that by the time we really get to those younger age groups where it's just available to the general population, um, there's not gonna be a, a difference between the two. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, our next question is for Dr. Castorino. And the question is, should I get vaccinated if I have diabetes and other health conditions? The uh, short answer is probably. Of course, this is educational and not medical advice, but in general, the, 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 what, the way the vaccine helps us is by reducing our, the severity of illness, severely reducing. And so when you look at these big studies, their biggest outcome measure is were people who got COVID after the vaccine, after receiving the, all the vaccine doses, were they hospitalized? And so that's, that's the question. And in general, if you have, you know, the longer your list of, of, of health problems, the, the higher your risk of having a bad outcome for anything, you know, for influenza, for, you know, just for all of it. And so, you know, same with this, the idea, idea is, is if your body's immune system has the, has the answers, is already kind of ready, um, then, th then you won't get as sick and you avoid the hospital and hopefully th then those other systems like your heart aren't pushed as much. Great, thank you. Oh, Kristen, did you want to add something to that? Um, no, not, I think that kind of covers it. I thought I cut you off. That's why I was asking. I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, the next question is for you, Krista Nelson. And the question is, when will people with diabetes get the vaccine? The million dollar question. <laughs> I know, boy, it must be so frustrating. They just keep changing the rules every single day, don't they? Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, it's important for those of us in, uh, you mentioned there's some out of state viewers. In California, the, the county, the state, uh, the state and, and local county health departments have been primarily in charge of um, rolling out these vaccines, setting up clinics, distributing these immunizations. Um, literally, as we're on this call, that control of distribution and decision making is being handed over through a contract through Blue Shield. And um, I, I'm involved with weekly Zoom calls with the county health department providers where they go over all of this data and what the next step is. And um, they're kind of not sure what their role is going to be with this, this new contract. But what it appears to be happening is that Blue Shield is um, going to be creating, um, taking over that distribution, hopefully in a more streamlined, uh, equitable, equitable manner. Um, I honestly feel like, you know, our, our local department um, has done a great job of setting up their system and uh, they, it's also important to know that each county has to follow what the state guidelines are. So even though we're seeing on the on media that, you know, a certain county is deciding to vaccinate a small, you know, population of, of teachers, and then another one is saying, no, we're only sticking to 75 and above, you know, a lot of that has to do with the supply, you know, are they expecting a supply just this week? Um, I, I got an email from the county health department that their supply for February 19th, this Friday's vaccinations, have had to be rescheduled due to all of these snowstorms that are happening in the Midwest, um, delayed their shipment. That shipment was actually, um, they were expecting double what they were told they were going to get. 
And so we already are seeing these amazing big bright spotlight at the end of this tunnel that the supply is going to start just rolling out very healthily. But, um, you know, that won't be in the media this week because it got shut down because of the that snowstorm. As soon as that snowstorm's done, our county and our, our state and all of the states are, are getting bigger supplies coming their way. Um, there, there are some areas, um, Katie, I sent you a couple of slides today about where you can look to um, be sure that you, you don't miss that moment that says it's your turn. Yeah. Um, Do you want me to share the screen? And uh, Sure. Okay. So that first one is, um, let me make my screen a little bit bigger. Uh, Here, it's California State Public Health Department. Uh, find out if it's your turn. So um, you hit that box of check my eligibility, they ask you a few questions. Um, it's pretty quick at the beginning here. And then um, it asks you what county you live in. And for those of you living out of state, um, my understanding is that they're, if they haven't already, the plan is to roll out this same website uh, nationwide so that you can get on there, put your age. They may ask you a few things of what area you work in. Um, and it's gonna let you know, yep, it's your turn and this is where you're gonna sign up versus um, no, it's not quite, you know, your, your particular scenario is not quite up yet, but would you like to sign up and receive an email when you do meet the criteria? And I think this is important because if, you're, if you do get that email that says, you know, you are eligible, you're gonna know to start getting online at one of, the, one of the places that there's going to be more vaccine available is your local pharmacy. So wherever you get currently get your pharmacy supplies, um, start watching that. So if I get my supplies, you know, my prescription refill from CVS, um, all of these main CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, Save on Drugs, all have uh, websites where you can sign up for those vaccines. And if you don't qualify at that moment, they still give you the option of, you know, would you like to be emailed when, when your turn is, or when we do have new appointments, would you like information about that? So uh, those uh, local pharmacies besides the public health department and whatever Blue Shield decides to roll out um, is going to be out. Um, I know that there's been a lot of controversy about the fact that this next group of high risk um, patients uh, only include type one and not uh, a type two and not type one uh, patients. That patients are affected with type one diabetes. That is also most likely going to be a conversation between you and your diabetes specialist. Um, I, I think grouping someone uh, with type one or type two is not really necessarily fair. Uh, if you're someone that has type one diabetes, but also some kidney um, changes or uh, retinopathy, you know, it, it's not just a one size fits all. And so I think it's really important to be sure that you talk to your endocrinologist or your diabetes specialist about, is there something else about my health besides the fact that I have type one that might um, be looked at as, as, a, as a compounding condition that may help me get, get to the top of that, that list. And, um, and I, th I think every, every patient, no matter what your um, chronic health illness is really should be looked at in a more individual basis. So um, try, and, try and not smash your TV the next time they put on there that, that you don't, uh, you know, you're not put into that, that, next, that next year because we all have seen that they, they, they do change the rules pretty much every Thursday apparently, so. Well, thank you. I thought, um, 
a difficult question to answer, but there's really good resources out there too to find out. Um, I can send out tomorrow links to everything we talked about uh, today okay. as well to all of our participants. So if you guys didn't catch all the links, I'll be sure to send that out, not to worry. Um, the next question is for Dr. Castorino and um, Kristen Nelson talked a, a little bit about this too, but it said why, the question is why are type two, those with type two diabetes often most cited as COVID-19 vulnerable rather than those with type one? The short answer is I want to blame it that everyone gets type one and type two confused and does all sorts of like, it's just, it's, it, it's biased. And part of the reason why it's biased is back to what Kristen Nelson was describing with the studies is in order to decide if the vaccine is, or the effect of uh, COVID on a particular population, you need to have a certain number of those people. Um, and so long story short, the studies were powered more to learn about, there were many more people who had type two diabetes and COVID than there were with type one and COVID. And so it wasn't the correct sample size. And so we couldn't draw conclusions, but conclusions were drawn nonetheless. And then later on, there was better data that showed no actually it, there is significant risk in type one as well, but the, you know, the, it had already had its, its, its moment oh, in, <laughs> and, and so everyone kind of made their conclusion that, that, you know, and guidelines got set. Um, one thing that's for sure about this pandemic is the reality as we know, it seems to change on a weekly and sometimes daily basis. And so we're constantly having to review and revise guidelines. And when we're looking at, you know, big federal guidelines, that's a little bit slower, even though they're going at a fast pace compared to normal. Thank you, Kristen. Um, the next question, Kristen Nelson, you, you did touch on this already is, um, how do I know when I'm eligible to receive the vaccine? Yeah, because again, those rules keep changing. I, I would really strongly um, recommend keeping an eye on your local county health department website, um, Ventura County, Santa Barbara County, San Luis Obispo County, out of state, same thing. Um, in Santa Barbara County, we have um, something called a 211. Um, it's, it's, that phone number is kind of considered your one stop shopping for for overall needs, whether it's housing or uh, food shelter, uh, food banks, um, and they added a new uh, subtype of that is part of the, um, you know, if you drop that down into where uh, it says COVID-19, um, it lets you know where uh, access to testing is access to vaccination updates. Um, you can see this email for the general public uh, where it says vaccine at Santa Barbara County Public Health Department, uh, sign up to receive vaccine information. Uh, I, I think they've done a really, really amazing job. And I, I, I just have really um, high hopes that um, the Blue Shield system will also provide um, the same uh, equitable immunization access and access to that information. Um, you may have seen on the news that FEMA has set up some big super site vaccinators in LA County and there is plan for one of those to be placed here in Santa Barbara County as well, um, where uh, at uh, Cal State LA, they're, they're vaccinating between six and 7,000 a day um, since Monday. Uh, and so those big chunks like that in, and knowing that these, these shipments that are doubling in size coming to our community is all good news. It's all really good news. And um, it's, it's time to definitely be keeping a really sharp eye on the county health department and uh, these other resources that Katie's gonna send you, your, your local pharmacy, uh, they all are getting prepped and ready. Uh, most of them are already vaccinating in skilled nursing facilities. Um, and so these barriers, I just truly see them just starting to crumble. 
very, very, very soon. So it's time to definitely get um, get all your supplies ready for that sick day in case you need it. And um, we will do everything we can to keep our eye on that information and, and make sure that we get that available to you on our website. The moment we hear of any new changes on ages or criteria, um, and, and again, make sure you talk to your primary care um, about, is there, is there anything about my particular condition that uh, we need to talk about to really individualize my, my ability to access my first dose? It's just so encouraging to hear that, um, you know, the vaccines are going to be rolled out um, more, so much more for the community, both the diabetes community and just the, the general public. So I'm really encouraged by, um, by that. So thank you, Kristen. Mm -hmm. um, we have about five more minutes and we have two more questions left. Um, so the next question is for Dr. Castorino, uh, what happens after I get the vaccine? Can I still infect people with COVID-19? Yes, um, the, the short answer is we're gonna assume yes. We're gonna, we're gonna be extra safe um, and we all wanna get on top of this. And so we're gonna assume that even though you have, once you have both, um, either one or both uh, doses of vaccine, um, you still need to wear a mask until, until guidelines change. But so it's still post-vaccine, stay six feet apart, social distancing, um, avoid gatherings, mask wearing, um, all of it. And, and to, to break that down, what's happening is your, your body um, has all the tools to quickly um, basically destroy the virus if, if you come into contact with it. But there's a chance that you could have a little bit of it and it could potentially spread. So while we don't know um, all the details about this, let's assume yes and keep wearing masks. Great, thank you. I know that's a, a heated topic as well. So that's really great to hear kind of the science behind it. Um, and our last question for the evening is for uh, Kristen Nelson. And you are, I, I believe you answered this, but I just wanna make sure. Um, when will children under the age of 16 be expected to, to be vaccinated? You know, um, there, there is a, a line with these pediatric studies that they feel that there is going to be a turning point where they can make a intelligent deduction that if we continue to see no adverse events with teens and junior high age and 12 and 11s, we're going to be able to make that same conclusion with down to toddlers. We kind of went all the way. We kind of skipped some of those pediatrics and went to uh, pregnancy. You know, does it appear to be safe in pregnancy? And so they're they're watching uh, those newborns as well. And and so they're 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 closing that gap. They're they're meeting the dots um, to be sure that. There isn't anything about the, the very youngest that they've put in. And they are actively, there are, um, I believe, down to six now that are in the research. Um, we just don't have that information quite yet on um, the long-term long effects. But so far, they've continued to feel very positive that they're not finding uh uh, you know, that, that they're able to connect those dots and be able to say, okay, down to this age group seems to be uh, safe and effective. Uh, and, you know, in pregnancy, it's safe and effective. So they're just, they're just reaching those dots. And I, uh, I, I, some of those conversations, again, is going to be in the primary care office, you know, there there are pregnant women that have had to make that decision. You know, I don't. There's not as much information, um, but what information we do seems to be pretty clear. My my risk versus benefit ratio in my scenario. Um, there's other women that have chosen to delay, just like it in all age groups and all populations. There are some um, people that choose to delay so that they can just wait and, and see what, um, what as we roll this out, if there's any surprises. But I think when, when anytime we're talking about um, 
you know, uh, the younger age group, there are going to be some, some deductions made by as we get into these, you know, 15, 14, 13, 12 year olds, if we're not seeing any, any uh, adverse events, then we can make a pretty intelligent conclusion that two years younger, there's not going to be anything, any surprises that we don't know about. So again, as we've, we've got a lot of population ahead of a typical subject or patient with type one at the youngest age, uh, that's going to give us a lot more information and a lot more confidence when they say, all right, let's, let's get everyone with diabetes uh, vaccinated. I hope that's going to make every parent out there feel feel more confident that um, they have as much information as they can um, to make their decision. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think that's, we're at, sadly out of time. This has been just so incredible just to hear from um, Kristen and Nelson, both you and Dr. Castorino. Um, while I still have everybody on the line too, I wanted to uh, share, I'll send out a link tomorrow. SDRI is conducting and has been conducting throughout the pandemic a survey on type 1 diabetes and COVID-19 and just kind of your experience with it. We, we'd love to gather as much information as we possibly can. And so I'll be sharing that link. We also have another link, um, the Type 1 Diabetes Exchange. Uh, they're located in Boston. They're a big data hub and resource for the Type 1 community. And um, they also not only for uh, just information, but for research opportunities too. And so um, I have, uh, I'll send out that link tomorrow. But if you want to register with the Type 1 Diabetes Exchange, you can get emails about about clinical research trials coming up and um, in your area. And so the, it, it's a really great hub for resources for uh, the type one community as well. Um, it doesn't cost anything. It's like, it may, I think it's maybe, gosh, 13 or 15 questions. So it's, it's non-invasive. Um, so both of those are really great resources. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions about um, any of the questions, or have new questions, again, just shoot me an email. I'll try to get those answered. All the links will come in your email tomorrow at some point. The recording will be available later this week. And I just wanted to thank you, um, Kristen and Kristen, again, I know how busy you guys are with your clinical research and just taking the time to speak with us. This has been such a valuable hour of education for us. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for participating. And I know it's uh, not ideal on Zoom, but I'm just, really happy for the opportunity to still be able to connect with you all. Um, I hope everyone has a great week and, um, you know, reach out if you need anything at all. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody.